Hi everyone. You can see from the title that there's two topics in this presentation, but it's the second one on the steps towards an international community of practice that I'm going to concentrate on mostly. Before I start, I'd just like to distinguish between virtual labs and remote labs. Uh, you're probably familiar with this. Our virtual labs is where somebody sits down a PC, connects over the internet to essentially a mathematical model or a computational model, and it simulates outputs based on the inputs of the student at the PC. Of course, this can be done locally as well as over the internet. They can download the simulation. Remote labs, on the other hand, are connecting across the internet to real physical equipment that a student might not have at home. They're able to control that equipment, control certain parameters, and able to take measurements of the outputs of what's going on with that equipment. Now, you can see the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the physical equipment can be hard to scale up. Um, a, and there's probably a limit to what we can do with, uh, you know, we can't, it can be difficult to build physical equipment for some experiments, whereas the simulations maybe lack a certain realism for the students and the data might be a little bit too clean as it were. Okay. So why do we need online labs in the first place? Well, Sometimes labs are expensive to build, so it can be difficult to get the resources, both the equipment and the people to supervise it and the people to maintain it. Uh, the students maybe are quite constrained because of that in the amount of time they can spend in a lab. Some labs we can't, just can't do because of safety. And the fourth one there is one that us in distance learning, uh, a challenge we have, which is we want to reduce the amount of time our students have to travel to centres to access equipment because they're mostly working adults and it's not convenient for them to do this. If you look at this picture here, this is a rig that we built in Sligo. It's moderately complex on a small tabletop with a computer underneath it. The student dials in over the internet to that PC, uh, can vary parameters, control that equipment. In fact, it's a control uh, experiment. So they write a control program to control that. There's cameras there that they can use to watch what's going on. And of course, it is measuring their sensors there and it's doing various measurements. It's quite a task building that. Imagine if you were a lecturer and had four of these in a, a topic you were teaching. Imagine if you had four topics that you were teaching in a, in a particular semester. Imagine the department head who has a whole lot of these uh, uh, topics being taught or a school. This, once you get up to university level, the scale of this is quite enormous. It's a big challenge. And there are lots of solutions out there, remotely accessible labs, as we've described there, simulations, okay. Digitized labs is another uh, way of looking at it. I suppose digitized labs is where we would set up a real lab, run it through various parameters, collect the data, and then keep that data in the database. So the student later on will remotely vary parameters and they will get the data from the database. So it does do a good job of simulating the measurement type of challenges, measurement errors, type, those types of things, but it does look like a simulation. Uh, KITS is another solution that's been used in distance learning and it's beginning to, of course, this is more important now that we are in COVID and I see people are even using KITS for the students during COVID. There are lots of solutions, but the problem is finding them. Now, there are existing networks. Some of these are university networks that have got together. Maybe they've got grant and they're, they tend to be closed and they're working on hardware, remote access hardware. Some of these are really just people who are getting together and making lists of software, a list of lists of resources that are available on the internet. But there's no real network there that really is an open network that anyone can join. So we set one up. Uh, the benefits of collaboration, we need, really need to think about them, maybe just list them out. It's, it's about maybe collecting information, coming together to collect information and compiling it centrally to make it easy for people to find it when they need it. Um, it's about maybe people who are working on a particular topic, introduction to thermodynamics. They divide out the workload for searching and developing new experiments. Uh, it could be for reducing costs through sharing. Uh, it's not necessarily just about sharing rigs or software, sharing ideas in general and designs. Those are reasons to collaborate. Uh, also, if we have hardware, allowing each other access to hardware, it's quite difficult to do, actually. We need to be able to set up the systems that are safe and secure for the institutions, but allow people from other institutions to access their hardware. I would suspect that if we looked at the learning outcomes of various topics we teach, we may find that uh, 
from a pedagogical design point of view, some of the outcomes that we use labs for may not need labs at all. Maybe we can provide them with data. Maybe we can ask them to do, to design experiments. We may actually, if we get together and look at pedagogical design and discuss this, we may find we don't need as many labs as we think. Now, one thing I should say about this uh, group is it's not a learning society. You may be an academic in some area and in engineering but when it comes to teaching you're a practitioner and practitioners like to share tips and tricks that that's what really this is about and share information uh, we have set up an international peer support community it's on linkedin there's a shortened link to it it was set up about three years ago and it's been slowly growing but there are challenges and there are challenges that i think maybe some of you might help us with for starters there's the idea of the uh, critical mass. How big does it have to get? There's actually only a few people post. Why are the other people not posting? Are we on the right platform? Okay, LinkedIn is a, I think, a sort of a poll platform. People have to go to it, so they're probably missing most of the posts. Should we go to a push platform like Google Groups, which pushes messages out to people every day or every week? What sort of services should we provide? We mentioned shared documents. Should we create shared documents? Should we use the existing ones and encourage each other to contribute to the existing shared documents are there? Should we provide a discussion forum where people can discuss common challenges? Should we run webinars? Uh, should we get work on getting people together? And how will we sustain it? How will we get it to work in the long run? If you think you can benefit from this community or if you can th think you can help with those challenges, we'd very much like you to join. Uh, that's my contact details at the bottom there, and there's a link to the group. I want to thank you all very much for listening.